Welcome to Risk Roundup. The emerging autonomous systems technology seems to be transformative and disruptive and holds the potential for enabling entirely new intelligence and automation and autonomous capabilities for human environment where direct human control is not physically possible. Now, since these new emerging technologies are capable of adapting to changing conditions, knowledge, and constraints, they are assigned broad objectives to increase performance, productivity, efficiency, enhance safety and security, and even reduce cost. As a result, in recent years, the capability of such autonomous systems and their domains of application have expanded significantly in cyberspace, geospace, and space. As seen across nations today, robotics, control, and automation are already becoming intrinsic to many aspects of human lives and are rapidly becoming an important element of nation strategy for future development. To discuss artificial intelligence-driven autonomous systems further, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Hans Mom to Risk Roundup. Dr. Hans is an autonomous systems expert, <clears throat> a futurist, and principal investigator of Victoria Systems based in the United States. Welcome, Dr. Hans. We are delighted to have you on Risk Roundup. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me on the show. Wonderful, uh, Dr. Mom. So how important do you think is autonomous systems technology becoming for nation science and technology vision? So I think it's becoming one of the most important things. Uh, the challenge that uh, the autonomous systems have is, is that they're out there to do the dull, dirty, dangerous jobs <clears throat> that maybe you don't want humans to do. So right now, to give you a little bit of, an, uh, of a taste of where it's going, right now in the United States, we look at autonomous systems in four different layers. We look at it as uh, unmanned air vehicles, unmanned ground vehicles, unmanned underwater vehicles, and unmanned water vehicles, so like boats. <clears throat> the challenge with that, though, is, is that the rest of the world doesn't look at four. They actually look at seven. So they say, yes, we agree with those four. However, we think that cyber is also a, an autonomous system. We think humanoids are autonomous systems. And we think that exoskeletons are autonomous. <clears throat> so the rest of the world is actually moving quicker than the United States is when it comes to some of these autonomous systems. So when you're looking at, at research, when you're looking at defense applications, when you're looking at just basic, simple um, criminal uh, um, anti-crime and law enforcement applications, the world is now open to everything. <clears throat> so if you have all seven of these autonomous systems, what happens when they start to talk to each other? What happens when they start to not only talk and communicate with each other, they start to actually be programmed to be smart enough to take over when the when one of them is done. So if you have an, a, a, a chase, say a police chase, so you're chasing a suspect, and so you have a car, an autonomous car chasing that suspect. Now you'd rather have an autonomous car chasing the suspect than a police officer in there who could get hurt. Once that suspect car, say, is disabled, uh, through different means, an electronic pulse or some other means, the unmanned air vehicle that was following it could actually take over the scene and keep everybody informed as to what's going on, as well as there are some states, uh, including um, North Dakota, uh, here in the United States, North Dakota actually allows weaponizing their UAVs in, uh, in the pursuit of criminal justice. So you can actually have uh, a UAV that has a taser system on it, uh, has tear gas system on it, uh, you can actually weaponize it uh, in North Dakota now. So autonomous systems are going to be some of the most important things uh, that come into our lives uh, since the internet or since anything you can imagine. Um, I actually wrote about part of this in one of, uh, one of my books, looking at the idea of revolutions. So we had the Industrial Revolution, which was about 250 years. We had the IT Revolution, which was about 50 years. And some people still think uh, um, wrongly that we're still in the IT Revolution. We're not. Uh, we are in two revolutions at the exact same time. 
the first time in human history that it's ever happened. So we're actually in an autonomous systems revolution and a biomedical revolution. I can now inject you with a robot and fix you. That's how crazy life is getting. That is, a, that is a real application now, the robot fixing that you are saying. Are we at a point where we can commercialize that and inject that? They are getting to the commercialization. However, they have already started human trials and it's functioning quite well. Oh, that's uh, really good to know. And maybe I need to do a risk round upon that. But the point that you made about, you know, so many different nations are having so many different uh, strategies as far as the autonomous system goes. And as we see, you know, this year, one of the trend is that, you know, in the cyberspace, all these malwares and cyber attacks that we were, uh, we are used to having, you know, over the years, now they are going to be, you know, autonomous, you know, now they are going to be artificial intelligence driven. So it is going to add a lot of complexities. It's not only just, you know, uh, the initiatives that we are fo focusing on here in United States, but, you know, all across nations, China is advancing and so many other, you know, nations are, you know, aggressively going forward on that. And the one point that you made was excellent that when all these systems start talking to each other, who is going to be in control? How would, how would we know what is going on? What are they learning? What are they perceiving? So these are very complex challenges that are coming our way, especially, you know, when we think from the security perspectives. Now, when you look at, you know, you are, as you said, you have been doing research and, you know, keeping up with all these different uh, developments that is happening in this, you know, autonomous systems and artificial intelligence field. So when you look at all these different applications that are emerging across nations, the kind of nature of the systems that are, everyone is trying to develop, what areas you think are essential for the further development of autonomous systems based on the vision you see of nation strategic research, not just of United States, but you know many other countries who are already involved in this? So many other nations are, are a lot farther ahead than the United States is. Um, <clears throat> it's not always great to say that, but it is the truth. So if you look at um, certain applications, I'd mentioned uh, humanoids, human robots. <clears throat> uh, Russia actually has some very interesting human robots that are functioning very well. So, it, and they have, they're not, they're not trying to hide them. They're out on the, you can, you know, you can literally just do YouTube. And if you understand, you know, programming at all, you can see that the robots are actually very fluid in their motion. So they're not, uh, they still have a little bit ways to go to get them to full autonomous, but they're getting there very quickly because you can actually see the actuators on the robots, everything moves and it moves fluidly. It's not a jerky motion uh, like the older robots <clears throat> that are around. The other thing is, is that uh, they're actually as advanced that they're, uh, they being Russia are sending a, uh, autonomous, uh, system up to space, up to the international space station. So they're sending one of their humanoids up to the international space station. That's how far advanced they are. But when you look at different nations, you look at Africa, Rwanda, Africa is one of the first, uh, nations to have a drone port, not Dallas, Texas. How is it that it's not Dallas, Texas? It's Rwanda. And one of the reasons for that is, is simply because of the policies, laws, governance, and leadership. In, in America, we continue to struggle <clears throat> with policy, laws, governance, and leadership when it comes to everything from unmanned air vehicles to just the autonomous systems to cyber to now we're, we're going into what I call the buzzwords, which is, is artificial intelligence, machine learning, things along that line. Uh, cloud, we, we love all the new buzzwords uh, here in the DC area. But when you look at these different uh, um, technologies and where they're really going to go, we have to understand that part of it is is defense driven because you know the defense industry, of course, is still the number one money maker in the entire world. Weapons is still number one. But then when you start to look at <clears throat> uh, growing food, science and technology, now you've got um, uh, drones that actually go down into caves and they actually have a cage around them. And I'll, I'll try not to yeah, go too far off camera here. <clears throat> so I do a lot of experimentations. Just I have a little 3DR solo drone that I use and I can get into the bay and put different modules in there in order to be able to do experimentations. Well, they have a, a newer version 
of a little UAV that has a cage around it and they can go down into caves. They can get places where, um, you know, normal humans simply cannot. Uh, and the interesting part about these things, by the way, is, is that they're so flexible now. The technology is open to anyone. It's not like 50 years ago <clears throat> where you had to be a NASA scientist to get a hold of one of these. These are cheap now. You can get them for a couple hundred dollars. Um, I actually was uh, working on a, a module for this one uh, where I could fly over your um, I could fly over your building and inject malware into your system. <laughs> Can you believe that the you know nature of the democratization of this entire you know artificial intelligence field has brought in so many complex challenges? That while it's exciting that anyone and from anywhere in the world has now a potential to develop whatever they want to, you know, they, there is no limit to the innovation, innovation, and they can access pretty much whatever resources they want. But it also brings us so many complex, you know, challenges and security risks. And now when you told that, when you just said that, you know, so many different nations are quite ahead than, you know, even United States. And here we are still, you know, I won't say struggling, but we are still not focusing on where our priorities are, you know, where the, so many other nations are rapidly, you know, advancing towards developing autonomous systems. So uh, while United States, you know, we, we are, like you said, you know, defense driven and a lot of, you know, advances in science and development comes because of those, you know, uh, focus area of defense but for many other nations it is not always you know defense driven so what are the drivers of such rapid yeah. research you know in uh for russia i understand you know they want to you know take a lead they always want to beat united states so there is that uh, always you know competition you know going on between us and russia so they may want to send one in you know space and you know go ahead and you know be the leader in that but you know I'm not sure if we are ready for, you know, I, I'm not sure what is the nature of the uh, autonomous system that we have, we'll have to evaluate that to come up with, you know, what are the uh, risks emerging from that. But like China and, you know, like many other countries, they are also developing so many systems that are autonomous. So what are the drivers of this rapid research in autonomous system? Are they all want to lead the industry? Do, do these nations want to lead or what? what, are, what is driving them? So, <clears throat> so the drivers, part of it is simply innovation itself. So I'll give you an example with the Rwanda situation. That was literally uh, um, innovation attempting to take up where, where money was not going to solve a problem. <clears throat> In Rwanda, you can, get, you can get supplies to an ocean port, but there is no infrastructure after that. There's just no infrastructure. So uh, one of the things that they're doing with the uh, um, UAVs in Rwanda is they're um, they're delivering blood, they're deli delivering uh, specific medical supplies with them. They're delivering, uh, you know, very uh, they're smaller payloads right now. They will get bigger, but we're looking at just the innovation of of how to be able to uh, move things, logistics, everything else. Every major logistics company actually has an unmanned uh, uh, system, an autonomous system program in, in place. <clears throat> DHL is one of the leaders. They have some pretty large ones that they're operating pretty well. Uh, FedEx, UPS, all of them have them. As a matter of fact, there is one that's uh, uh, starting to operate in sort of a, a very small pilot program here in America. And so if, say, FedEx, <clears throat> they have a driver and he has a route and he has he's all the way on the other side of the town and he has one package left to deliver and that's two you know almost two hours away because you know especially in dc trying to get from one side of the city to the other is very difficult they now have a system where uh the uab actually comes out of the top of the van flies the package to where it's supposed to be comes back and confirms that the package was delivered those type of systems that are getting to us to efficiency <clears throat> and effectiveness they're driving not only the the monetary systems but they're trying to drive uh you know the the quality of life for different places and different reasonings in the u.s we've had a couple of missteps so um i just finished a co-authored book um coming out of kansas state university uh titled unmanned aerial vehicles in the cyber domain how to protect u.s assets 
the reason that book was written was really to attempt to get people to understand the connection between the autonomous systems, <clears throat> cyber, where we're going, the autonomous world, AI. And the reason for that is, is that we've had a, a pretty good misstep if you've seen the, the, FC, the FAA. The FAA has struggled for decades now to figure out how to allow unmanned systems into the airspace. Um, it's not going very well. If you saw the reports over the last few days, uh, you've got UAVs that are closing down airports because uh, they're, they're uncontrolled. They don't know who's controlling them and they're going into the airspace and they're getting too close to commercial airlines. So they're having to shut down the entire airport. That's costing hundreds of thousands of dollars. So we've had a lot of missteps. There was a misstep in um, <clears throat> San Francisco. They, they being the San Francisco uh, um, government and the police were trying to figure out a way to reduce crime in a specific area. So they did a pilot program with a company and they had a robot and he was about five feet tall. He was a cylindrical type robot and he ran on wheels <clears throat> and winked and blinked and they put up a sign every however many blocks and it said recording audio uh, um, audio and video for your safety but the government forgot to actually talk to their people there was no true communication <clears throat> now think about it you wake up tomorrow you walk out of your house and there's this cylindrical robot winking and blinking. You don't know what it's doing. You don't know what it's measuring, what the sensors are on it. Is it armed? You don't know why it's there. Not very good communication. Huge misstep. So the people in the area got very, very mad and basically trashed the robot. $900,000 and they smashed it, uh, tipped it over, and they actually had to send police in to go retrieve the police robots. <laughs> There's the missteps that are being done are really hurting the industry. And yeah. not, not only just from that point of view, but you start down the road of uh, the ethics. You know, is it really ethical to be arbitrarily putting a robot out there and not even explaining to people, you know, I would have looked at this robot as a threat. Absolutely as a threat. I don't know what's in there. I don't, you're, you're claiming that it's audio visual. How do I know it's not taking my temperature, following where I'm at? How do I know it's not tracking everything that I'm doing? How do I know that? I don't know that. So we've had a lot of missteps and the communication challenge. And then you get into the ethics of when you're looking at these different systems, is it really ethical to be sending these systems in? This robot was supposed to, to reduce crime. Well, okay, we spent billions of dollars doing community policing programs, policing programs, and everything else. It isn't the way to reduce crime human to human. It, we've got so many missteps. And so that ethical argument of, well, we put the robot out there because it was safer. It was doing a dull, dirty, dangerous job we didn't want a human to do. Okay, but is it going to be effective and does it make sense? The ethical arguments for these things, um, we're still trying to figure out. When you look at, I'm sure you've seen that Saudi Arabia uh, made uh, uh, Sonia, uh, um, Sonia, it's basically an artificial intelligent robot. They gave her um, uh, citizenship. So that's a huge issue because now, say I'm, an, uh, I'm a hacker and I'm hacking in, into Saudi Arabia and she just happens to be online at the time and I damage her. Technically, I just damaged a Saudi citizen. Yes. I just created an international incident. Yes. We have so many ethical questions, we can't even begin to start. <laughs> Very true. I mean, it's it definitely means that you know the boundaries between man and machine are blurring it. By the just example you gave about Saudi Arabia, that it's a citizen now. So mm -hmm. uh, we don't. I mean, if a machine can be a citizen, humans are citizens. The voice, you know, seems same. Uh, the actions, you know, the purpose, and you know, <coughs> the power of responsibilities are same. How do we differentiate what is man and machine? And there is no doubt that 
that you know they are providing tremendous benefits providing you know productivity efficiency you know and where humans cannot go they are you know able to go and even you know it's becoming cost eff effective but at the same time the examples that you gave like you know the drones are now being weaponized and you know drones are uh, uh, create uh, not uh, you know shutting down the airports the example that you just gave and also that when you are developing autonomous systems that go in the cyberspace so far you know the we did not the humans were involved in uh, we we knew that who, who is after you know how many humans are going after uh, cyber assets so we were able to have some sort of control now if we you know integrate that with the ai and make it autonomous <coughs> We have no idea whose cyber assets are a threat or whose you know assets in uh, geospace are a threat because of that because it, now it's all autonomous who is controlling so the challenge is that while we still have to figure out all these you know ethical issues and security issues but what is exactly the goal of autonomous systems is it to just remove the human component or <clears throat> we know to bring efficiency so are the developers creators of these autonomous systems do they understand clearly what the goal is or they do they define goals you know if uh, properly because if these any of this system goes out of control it becomes autonomous then you know it just designs itself it just you know decides what it wants to do you know uh, in the next step then we will have no control humans will have no control over how to stop it or you know where to stop it or what to do about it so what are what is the goal of this auto autonomous system <clears throat> is it to remove human component or is it to you know bring efficiency and you know uh, help assist humans into doing tasks that you know humans are not able to do so i i'll i'll start in the answer by finishing sort of the last uh, block which is really looking at the idea of, of the, the human AI and what that means. So there is a Canadian researcher right now who's basically saying that um, AI, once it becomes self-aware, so Watson claims that it is very close to being self-aware. And the reason why humans can claim to be on the top of the stack is because we claim to be self-aware. If the machine now becomes self-aware, does it deserve human rights? <clears throat> so there is a, uh, a Canadian researcher who is pushing very hard for that. And where that ends up going to is now the EU is trying to decide whether to grant robots, uh, to grant robots what they call personhood. And that's actually um, in uh, January 2017. And again, in 2018, the European Union passed a motion adopting a report that calls for the development of electronic personhood regulations for robots and AI systems. So it, the, the ethical questions are getting mixed up very, very quickly. <clears throat> so now let me jump ahead and answer your question. Why are they being developed? <clears throat> Part of it is, is because when you use uh, deep learning or machine learning or AI, you can make connections that have never been made before. <clears throat> so in the good way, we have cancer researchers who are basically taking just terabytes worth of data and they're running AI and machine learning against them, deep learning, and they're actually creating links to figure out how to, uh, to deal with cancers that we would have never been able to do before. <clears throat> no human being could take all that information in and then be able to do something with it. So, on the good side, they are trying to do good things. On the challenge side, <clears throat> we're sort of running into uh, a, a territory that is completely unknown. Um, it's unregulated. Uh, we don't really understand it very much. And we do things. And again, we've made some missteps. <clears throat> so you've heard of them. You've heard of the, the you know, Google and, and Facebook and a few other people have had some challenges. So Google actually had. <clears throat> a very interesting uh, AI setup. And one of them was called uh, DeepMind, and it basically pitted two individual neural networks against each other. And what they were trying to do was they, they put little uh, emojis, little fruit things out there. And the idea of the game was that uh, they you should go out and get more fruit. So the two neural networks 
uh, gathered fruit. What they found out, though, was when they made the fruit scarce, they would start to fight. Two neural networks who had never been trained to go against each other, we gave it a simple goal, go and get the fruit. They had to stop that one. They also had another one that uh, it was called wolf pack hunting. And the idea was, would they coexist or would they fight? And again, it was the same idea with, with uh, you know, apples. You know, when, when the fruit started to, to become scarce, they started to fight each other. So as, it, as the players continued uh, to learn and adapt uh, to the changing environment, the frequency at, at, at which they would fight actually increased. So even in the AI world, <clears throat> when we kind of let it run amok, it's not working out very well. We're sort of running into a territory that we understand the right and left bounds of it a little bit. So the basics of AI is, is that you can either train a system to have, you know, to go after a goal, or you can give it a goal and let the machine go and, and figure out how to obtain the goal. <clears throat> so we understand the basics of that. Everywhere else in between, we're guessing most of the time. Yes. Now, uh, so it seems you are right. So from what you are telling me, do, is it uh, that all these, you know, autonomous systems, they are trained or they are untrained or how, what is the, <clears throat> how is it being designed that, okay, this is a system we are going to train and this is a system we are going to let it train itself. You know, it will let it figure <clears throat> out where, what it needs to do. So, so what I'll, is the approach? So I'll give you two different examples. <clears throat> there was a, um, there was a, 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 a project that was done out in Colorado uh, and was for the defense industry. And what they were trying to do was uh, make an autonomous uh, uh, vehicle. It was many years ago. <clears throat> and they were trying to get this car to be able to uh, run the roads without human intervention. Just push a button and it would go and do things. So they programmed it and they, they basically gave it the goal. I said, here's your goal. <clears throat> you figure out within your environment how to obtain that goal. <clears throat> so they figured out how to do it and they had the vehicle and it was running great. They pushed the button, it would run on the roads, everything was working wonderful. So they called back to DC, they had you know all the, the generals and everybody who uh, put all the money into this, they said, we got it, it's perfect, come and see it. So they put the vehicle away, they never touched it. A week later, they were going to have the, the, the bands playing and everything else, and they were going to run this thing out. Well, in Colorado, in the summertime, they said, okay, this is what we're going to do. So generals got out there, bands are playing, they put the vehicle uh, uh, in place, they push the button, the car launches itself right down into a, a gully. They said, wait, 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 look at the birdie, look over here, uh, get some coffee, we're going to try this again. So they push the button again, and it goes right into the ditch. <clears throat> what they found out was, in, in doing the forensics, was that in Colorado during the summertime, if you mow the grass, it becomes brown. Well, what the vehicle had learned, because it was a dirt road, is brown is good, green is bad. Well, they wanted everything perfect for the generals. So somebody went out and mowed the grass. So that's an example <clears throat> of giving it the ability to learn within its environment. But if you don't understand what it learned and why it learned it, you could end up in a ditch. Yes. So there's the second one is if you try to train the system and you give it a, a goal. So I'll give you a, an idea. So. Microsoft put out an AI bot um, that they put up on Twitter. And the bot's name was Taya, T-A-Y. And they trained the bot to the point where it was supposed to go get followers and it was supposed to be a demonstrator that artificial intelligence could get followers and could interact with humans. <clears throat> However, within the training, they did not give it good enough parameters. and so she ended up getting about 50,000 followers um, and produced about 100,000 tweets. 
you're thinking, hey, this is pretty good in the last 24 hours. That's pretty good. Um, but the problem was, was she started to mimic her followers. So anybody could follow her. And what happened was that uh, the system was designed to learn from its users. So it became a reflection of the behavior of its users. Well, some of those users weren't exactly nice people. And so she was actually starting to mimic the bad behavior of the user. So again, you can train it, but if you don't give it good enough parameters to understand exactly what's going on, things end up going awry. So keep in mind that even at one time, um, IBM, uh, the Watson sort of got in trouble because Watson was swearing. <laughs> so, Yes, no, very true. I mean, that's an ex excellent example because that is the kind of nature of uh, security risk that we see emerging in the coming years because when <clears throat> all the systems, you know, AI-driven systems start learning on its own and when humans won't be involved, when we won't have any controls over it and uh, there is no accountability responsibility, it could learn anything. It could learn even to think that uh, humans are, you know, bad, let's just destroy them and that's where we would end up... Oh, you know, perhaps getting existential security risk emerging. So there are a lot of unknowns, like you said, and we will have to figure out how to uh, make uh, sure that we understand those unknowns and we develop some control so that it doesn't go out of control. But the example that you give about Russia, that they've already developed, you know, the space system, autonomous space system. So uh, thinking about it, that as nations prepare for these unprecedented space missions. I mean, right now, because of this democratization of nanosatellites, I mean, everybody is excited. Everybody is trying to get into this, uh, you know, space and try to do research, not only that, but asteroid mining and all that deep space missions. It's very exciting. So as nations prepare for all these space missions and uh, not all spacecrafts and space habitats, aircraft, planetary and space uh, exploration platforms uh, and uh, operations, they are all not very known. They're all very complex. So to sustain these future complex systems, <clears throat> Where do you see the advances happening? I mean, Russia already, you know, uh, developed one system. I'm not, I don't have much knowledge about where that system is going to go or what it's going to do. But where do you see the advances happening in these autonomous systems and robotics uh, technical area to meet the goals of the space systems or meet the needs of the space systems? So I think where you're going to see when it when it comes to space in general is that you'll start to see that. Um, uh, um, the humanoids will come more into play because humanoids can go out and actually fix the the, the satellites. <clears throat> That's one of our big issues right now is we throw a satellite up there. If it has a problem, well, it's either a dead satellite or somebody has to go try to retrieve it. Well, how much money are you going to spend trying to retrieve it? And can you even retrieve it? So a lot of these satellites are in, in the different uh, um, you know Earth orbits that you may not be able to retrieve them. <clears throat> but you could send something out that has uh, a humanoid on it and the humanoid can actually uh, repair it. So the Russian humanoids are very interesting because they actually taught their humanoids to work, to drill, to drive, to weld. So they actually taught them to, to work. Um, and that could be for one of many reasons. Uh, you know, Russia, they have a, a challenge with uh, their population, their population has been going down. Uh, but so if they have more humanoids to work the land and work, they might be better off. Um, if you look at uh, the the war scenario, <clears throat> not only are you looking at obviously replacing a soldier with possibly a robot or teaming them together, if you end up into a nuclear, biological, or chemical situation, you can send the robot in and the robot can work the area where right now it's a no-go territory to the military. We, we won't go in there. <clears throat> so I think that when you're looking at that, that's sort of where you're going to start to go to. But I think if you're looking at overall the entire autonomous systems land, <clears throat> I think you're going to start to see all seven autonomous systems start to talk to each other. They're going to start to uh, go after goals. You're starting to see it sort of in, in one layer, but not multiple multiples. So you're starting to see it with like unmanned aerial vehicles. So you see the, the swarms <clears throat> and things like that that are going on. Um, but now, when do we get to the point where the, the swarm can swarm with vehicles and can talk to other things? <clears throat> so there was a uh, there was a 
research project that was done. It was all done in simulation. But what they did was they took an air vehicle, a ground vehicle, and a water vehicle. <clears throat> and they said, we're going to launch you from different locations. And we want you to meet on July 4th in Los Angeles, at the Port of Los Angeles. And your number one goal <clears throat> is to make it. And what they found out through this whole simulation was that like the air vehicle, it gave it weather and other things. The air vehicle started to uh, hit uh, headwinds. So because the internet is ubiquitous, it logged on to weather.com. It got the weather for the next few hours and figured out if I land now, I can save fuel and the tailwind will get me there on time. <clears throat> the water vehicle started to hit heavy uh, waves and it figured out there's nothing I can do. I'm simply going to sacrifice myself for the sake of the goal and hope that I get there. So the, the water vehicle did not make it in time but it basically sacrificed, it used up all of its fuel. So the ground vehicle basically had to log into MapQuest and figure out how to get there. In the simulation, what it was showing was that you gave three different autonomous systems a goal. They each looked at the exact same goal in different ways. They each attempted to meet that goal in different ways. And each of them were talking to each other at the same time because Basically, the, the air vehicle and ground vehicle talked to the water vehicle and said, if you have to sacrifice yourself, use your fuel, but we're going to make it so we're good. So when you look at, at where we're going, all seven of those autonomous systems starting to talk to each other is going to get really, really interesting. Keep in mind that right now we're, we're struggling just to deal with one. We're struggling to deal with UAVs. Really? And when all of them start to talk. We, we're going to end up into some challenge. Yes, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm thinking that how would these, as the, you know, more and more systems will emerge, how would the autonomous systems define and decide which goals are worthy to be pursued, you know, <clears throat> goals? So these are very complex uh, uh, challenges and risks that are coming our way. So uh, do you see a need for a meaningful human control for autonomous systems? And if yes, what would that meaningful human control <clears throat> like you know as we see more and more in autonomous systems emerging from across nations i think that <clears throat> control can take many different forms <clears throat> i think one of the ways that we need to control is that we need to start to look at at certain um infrastructure pieces so in america um every president since i was born said the same thing <clears throat> our infrastructure is crumbling we need new roads and bridges. Every single president has said that, including the current. And so every one of them has continued to try to rebuild roads and bridges, but they're doing it to the 1950s. So everything you see <clears throat> out your window was basically designed around the 1950s. So if we know that we have Google car, we have uh, all these different things. We know that autonomous systems are here today and we know that the U.S. is way behind. And I'll give you an example on that in just a second. Why are we not building an autonomous infrastructure? <clears throat> so meaning you don't need billions and billions of dollars to do this. So all of the unmanned, uh, unmanned cars, the Google car and things like that, are, they run basically the same way. They have a radar system in the front and they talk to a whole bunch of different computers and they try to understand the situational awareness around them. However, because we don't have a, an autonomous infrastructure, <clears throat> what it's learning is the best it can do. So if it's driving down your street every day and what it did was it learned its, its environment, but then you call a landscaper and you change your entire landscape, is that going to affect what the car knows? Well, how about we give it some help? So if we take a simple radar reflector, a $2 radar reflector, <clears throat> and put it every couple hundred feet on a highway, it now has a feedback mechanism to say, oh, I'm doing good. I'm in the right place. Why are we not doing that? 
we are so far behind in America on autonomous systems. And you say, well, how far behind are we, Dr. Mom? In Germany, Daimler is running 18 wheelers on the roads autonomous. In Germany, they actually have this, a, a separate office. So we have a Department of Motor Vehicles. They have a Department of Motor Vehicles, but they also have a section for autonomous vehicles. Does America have Department of Autonomous Vehicles? No. We're not even we're not even close. Why? It makes no sense. It makes no sense to be to to go out and literally repave the exact same road the exact same way, and then tell the American people we we did something good. We're 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 in the future. We're not in the future. We're in the 1950s. But for some reason, this is the way we want to go about it. Yes, we're in a lot of trouble when it comes down to that. Yeah, very true. I, I hear your point because I think all the decision makers, they are fighting wars of uh, uh, last century and uh, not focused on where the real complex challenges are and where we need to compete and what we need to do. So having said that, you know, what concerns you the most? when you look at the progress that is happening from across nations and that, you know, we are, like you said, you know, we are quite behind and <laughs> that, you know, U.S. is waking up or trying aggressively to compete or trying to do, trying to de build the infrastructure, like you are saying, and th there are many complex challenges that will emerge because this is about not only developing supremacy in artificial intelligence, but in developing systems that would give them competi competitive edge in cyberspace, geospace space, or, you know, in underwater, you know, and uh, so many even spaces that we don't even know exist yet. So there is not just, you know, developing the system, but what those systems can achieve that would benefit those <laughs> And so what worries you most and what would you like to tell our global viewers and listeners and especially nations decision makers as to what they should be doing in the coming tomorrow and also today? I think what worries me the most is, is that uh, we are taking these technologies and we're putting them into buzzwords uh, here in the D.C. area. <clears throat> and that has a ripple effect as things move forward. And we're throwing money and a lot of resources into places that may not be helpful for us long term. I'll give you an example. When uh, you know cloud came out, everybody ran for the cloud. And so I asked a simple question. I said, okay, so is a cloud not just a mainframe on steroids? Uh, okay. So the same way with artificial intelligence and machine learning. If we don't really understand what these things are, how is it that you know we're running towards these things? It's like cybersecurity. Uh, we used to have information uh, information assurance, and then somebody used the word cyber and security, and all of a sudden everybody was a cybersecurity expert. And the the government is handing out contracts right and left and throwing money every which direction for cybersecurity, even though nobody even understood what it was. We barely understand what it is today. <clears throat> so I think that for me, I worry that we are going to spend an, a, a tremendous amount of time and resources and energy moving in directions that we don't even understand based on buzzwords and, and running after contracts while other places in the world are focused on really getting goals and being able to go after uh, certain issues. So when you have almost every major autonomous systems uh, uh, company, uh, they either have an overseas uh, location or they left America. So you saw that Amazon several years ago <clears throat> during the Christmas season, they put out the video where they wanted to start to deliver packages. Yeah. We didn't, the, the policies, rules, laws, governance, leadership, we're still what, five, six years from that video? And we're not even close. Um, yet, if you go to Canada or the UK or other places, if you look up Amazon, they're actually flying in other countries. So that's why I say I think my fear is is that 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 the leadership is not going to understand this fast enough, and <clears throat> that we're not going to get where we need to go. We have a a generational shift. In, in thought process happening 
and I don't know it's happening fast enough to keep the U.S. Uh, uh, where it needs to be, and, and that's like on the edge of technological. Yes, I hear you on that. What you are describing is uh, uh, what I have been trying to tell everyone, that when we look at risks that are coming our way, what do you see right now? <clears throat> Each and every corporation, each and every entity, including governments, you know. Uh, but if you look at, you know, entities like, you know, corporations, businesses, what do they focus on? They focus on financial risk, operational risk, legal risk, compliance risk. But the magic, the if you look at the overall risk profile, the strategic security risk, which, you know, composes of almost 75 to 78 percent of the overall risk <coughs> Hardly any corporation or any decision maker is paying attention. And the same problem you just described about the entire country that as we, you know, try to go forward, our political leaders, our governance models, everything is, you know, failing. They are not aware or they are not focused on the strategic security risks that are, you know, facing our nation. If they were, then, you know, we would not be seeing the shutdown that we, were, you know, are seeing in our country right now. <clears throat> the divide that we have you know the, everyone the political ideologies are outdated so so many things that are outdated and they are just not focusing on what are the real challenges of our news media and everyone they are all focused on fighting you know last century's wars and well, nobody, I, nobody, I, I think that I, I think that if you look at <clears throat> it even when you try to explain this um, you know, I, I spoke to a group of CEOs and uh, CIOs um, probably about four months ago, and you try to explain to them what they need to do now to be ready for, for literally tomorrow, <clears throat> and they all look at you like you're crazy. So I ask a simple question. So in this country, we are just starting to look at uh, Daimler actually has uh, some 18-wheelers, some logistic uh, um, uh, trucks on the road they're just starting some pilot programs virginia seattle uh and nevada <clears throat> so it's coming it's going to show up so i asked these these major corporation leaders i said so when your logistics show up at your gate with an unmanned vehicle i said what are you going to do what are you going to do are you going to turn away your raw product? You need it. What are you going to do? Your your security guard <clears throat> is standing out there. There's nobody to talk to. What are you going to do? Have you started to write the policies? Have you started to talk to your logistics uh, uh, movers? Have you started to, to look at uh, what your cities are doing, what your towns are doing, what your state is doing? Have you started to write the autonomous policy so you understand that when that autonomous vehicle gets to your gate, what are you going to do? Are you going to open the gate? Great. You're going to open the gate. But did you write into your policy that who takes responsibility if this thing crashes? If the autonomous vehicle has a problem <clears throat> and causes some damage or causes some harm, did you put in your policy who's responsible for that? They all looked at me like I was crazy. I don't know why you think it's crazy. It's already happening over in Europe. Do you really think it's not going to come here? Or, or should we just go back to caves? It's amazing to watch the, the, the leaders of major corporations literally turn their heads at technology and, and just refuse to look at what they need to do. It's not difficult. But if your lawyers don't understand it, if your policy people don't understand it, if your, your workers don't understand it, this isn't about taking your job. We're, we're out of truck drivers. I mean, look at any statistic anywhere. We don't have enough truck drivers. And, and you know, businesses like Amazon are only increasing the logistics need, right? Because you can literally get a package to your door now, at least here in the D.C. area. We can get a package in under 24 hours. So the logistics are going up. But we're out of truck drivers so this is coming to you so why not be prepared why are we not looking at this why is it that the idea that to 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 hire a, a futurist like me to come in and and review your policies in your company to then say okay 
here's areas that you're going to need to look at. Here's where you need to start to look at you know, you know, where things are going and you need to be ready for them. Why wouldn't you do that? It, it, it's, it's a frustrating thing to, to see the world, see where the future is going, know that that's where we're going. I have actual empirical evidence that that's where we're going, yet our corporations and other people don't want to take the, take the time and make the change. Yes, I think there is a great need for education and awareness. And that is the reason why we launched this Risk Roundup initiative. So we can talk with decision makers like you and develop the thought leadership. Sorry. <laughs> develop <laughs> leadership that is so very essential to understand the level playing field that this technology innovations has brought to each and every nation and where the security risks are emerging and what what is the nature of the innovations emerging from across nations that we need to be aware about and what kind of preparedness you know we need to have so that we can effectively meet the complex security challenges coming our way so thank you so much dr man for participating in risk roundup today we appreciate your thoughtful insight on autonomous systems and our global viewers and listeners will benefit tremendously from the information you provided today. So even if a single decision maker is able to understand emerging autonomous systems and effectively manage the implications after listening to these discussions, this risk round of dialogue has been of service and we thank you for that. Well, you're very welcome. Thank you for having me on. A wonderful uh, Dr. Man. So Risk Roundup, a global initiative launched by Risk Group, is a security risk reporting for risk emerging from existing and emerging technologies, technology convergence and transformation happening from across cyberspace, geospace and space. We at Risk Group believe that risk management, security and peace, they walk together hand in hand. Though security is related to management of threats and peace to the management of conflict, risk management is related to management of security vulnerabilities as well as management of conflict. And it is not possible to conceive any one of the three without the existence of the other two. All three concepts feed into each other. We believe that the security we build for ourselves is precarious and uncertain until it is secure for everyone across nations. Tradition becomes our security. So if we build a culture of managing risk effectively, it will lead us to security and security will lead us to peace. So let's manage the existing and emerging risks together. For more information on the Risk Roundups, to watch the Risk Roundup webcast or listen to the Risk Roundup podcast, please go to riskgroupllc.com and do not forget to subscribe and share. Until next time, I'm Jayashree, host of Risk Roundup, signing off. See you next time. Thank you.